Um, so uh, this week we begin uh, chapter six, and so chapter six has two sections. This is the first section, section A. And so section A, um, we describe uh, the distributions that a data set can make, and we talk about the shape of it, we talk about the center of it, and then we also talk about what's called the measures of central tendency, and uh, those are mean, median, mode, and range. Um, and so here it says, when examining the distribution set of a data set, we generally look at the shape of the graph, the typical value, and the variation in the data values. And so we're going to talk about uh, what do these mean, the shape of the graph, right? Uh, what is the variation of the graph as well? And so first, let's talk about the shape of the distribution. So let's consider the general shape of a graph. So this is our question when we, when we talk about shape. We ask ourselves, is it symmetric? So do we have symmetry? If we draw a line right down the middle, will both sides be equal? Or would it be what we call skewed? The following is called a symmetric distribution or bell-shaped distribution. So symmetric and bell-shaped are synonyms, okay? This means the same thing, symmetric. We call it the bell-shaped curve. Um, why? Because think about it. If I was to draw that line in the middle, right, that line of symmetry, see both sides are equal. So how would you compare the left and the right sides of the graph? They look the same. How many mounds does the graph have? So we can uh, consider the word mound uh, as like a hump, right? Like on a camel. So here we just have one hump. So we say one mound. All right, let's look at the next graph. Here it's saying the next graph is described as skewed. And so look at the difference between uh, these two graphs, right? How, uh, question three is how is it similar? And then question four is how is it different? So let's uh, first think about how is this uh, similar, okay? Well, definitely the symmetry is not the same, but this has one mound and this has one mound. So that would be a similarity. You could say they both have one mound. How is this graph different from the previous one? Well, here we have the left side containing the majority of the data and the right side uh, containing um, definitely less data and also the shape is very different, right? So here we have a big kind of uh, hump on the left side, and then we have a very thin uh, mark on the right side. Uh, and so we could, um, one way to describe it would be the right side is much longer than the left side. So we use the words or terms skewed right or skewed left to describe graphs. So these are the two types of skewing we could have, skewed right or skewed left. The graph above is skewed right. How do you think, how do you, think you could define skewed right? Well, look at what's happening. If this is skewed right, right? We could uh, imagine or think of it as this graph has been pulled to the right. So if it's skewed right, then the right side should have that very skinny tip. If it's skewed left, then the left-hand side should have the skinny tip, and the right-hand side should have the bigger mount. So we could uh, summarize it something like the graph looks like It's being pulled or stretched to 
to the right. And then we use the word its tail to describe the ending is on the right side. Right, so this is a, a definition of what skewed right would be, right, in simple terms. And so skewed left would be pretty much the same thing, except you would just change these to left. So it would be the graph looks like it's being pulled or stretched to the left side, and the tail, or that skinny part, would be on the left side. All right, let's look at these examples down here. So it says, describe each of the following graphs as, and then here are our descriptions. We have symmetric, or we have skewed. And then if it's skewed, we have two options, right or left. So let's look at the first one, right? And so um, let's draw a shape uh, more or less around this. So if I was to kind of draw a shape more or less, this would go up like this, and then it would go down like that. Right? If I was to draw this shape, go down like this, uh, and this shape would be something like that. So now let's see if we can answer the question. So this one, what, uh, what um, type uh, would you say? Well, it's, it's clearly not symmetric. Right? We cannot draw a center line. These are definitely not equal. So it's either skew right or left. Well, one of the things I look for is the tail. So here, this is the tail. Where is the tail? It's on the right side, which means this is skewed right. All right, look at um, example seven. Here, we could more or less draw a line in the middle, and both sides are more or less equal. So this is what we could say symmetric. Now remember, uh, in the real world, right, which is what most mathematical problems are based on, you don't have perfection, right? We're not going to see the exact symmetry of every single part of this side will repeat on this side, right? But we're looking for overall. We're looking for a generalization. Uh, and then let's look at the last one. So again, here is definitely not symmetric, so we know it's skewed. So is it skewed to the left or skewed to the right? Well, let's look at the tail. Here's my tail. Is the tail on the right or the left? It's on the left. So this would be skewed left. All right, let's turn the page. All right, so now it says, for each of the following, choose whether the distribution is likely skewed left, skewed right, or symmetric. And then um, explain your choice. So let's look at the first example. So it says an exam where most people scored very low with only a few doing well. So this may be hard for you to kind of picture, so let's just invent a little graph here. Let's just invent a little um, example, okay? So it says a lot of people did bad, right? And only a few people did well. So let's start off our graph at say 40. So we have people who got in the, uh, say 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and then let's say 100, okay? So let's just invent a lot of people scored low okay so a low score what we could say is a failing score right so under 70. so let's say we got these are people maybe a, a lot of 60s and then you might have a few 70s a few 80s 190 and no 100s right and so this would match this description and so if we were to more or less create a look at the shape of our distribution. Okay, what kind of shape does this entail? That's right, this is likely skewed right. Mm -hmm. We could say the mount will be over 
the lower values. See? The lower values where most people scored low with a few values that are high, making a long right tail on the graph. So if you are unable to figure out um, the shape of the distribution just from the written description, try um, drawing an example. Because once you kind of see the, the graph, it makes a lot more sense which one it is. All right, let's look at B. So here it says the ages of all CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. So think about this. What would the ages of CEOs overall be? They're probably older, right? Um, typically to get to the position of a CEO, you probably have to work quite a bit, right? Move up the ladder. Of course, not every case, but here we're talking generalization. And so here we're looking at maybe CEOs would be maybe 50s and 60s. Right. And so if we were again to kind of just draw right a, a simple little diagram. Right. Um, you could start off, you know, people in their 20s starting to work, people in the 30s starting to work, people in their 40s, uh, people in their 50s and then people in their 60s. Right. Think about if, if this was, um, you know, 20 people that you were interviewing, how would the dots go? Right? Each dot represents one person's age. And so here, we could assume that a lot of them are in the 50s and 60s. So we may have a bunch of people here, but fewer people here, fewer people here, and maybe one or none in the 20 range. And so again, if we were to draw our shape, right, here we have what kind of skew? We have a left skew. So this is likely skewed left. The mound will be over The higher ages as most CEOs are probably in their 50s to 60s. Now, you could argue that um, this graph could be symmetric. Right? Uh, and what would be the case for that? Well, you could say, well, maybe we extend it until, you know, 80 or 90. Then you could say maybe there's a lot in, you know, 40, 60, 70, uh, and then it weans off in both cases. So you could kind of have that symmetric where both sides start off very low, right? So like um, probably not that many CEOs in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, maybe not as many CEOs in, say, their 80s and 90s, but then you have that bulk in the 50, 60, 70 area. Uh, so you could, a case could be made for asymmetric graph, okay? Now, unless we actually know the exact ages, we're not really sure, but it's definitely not gonna be skewed to the right. So it's definitely either skewed to the left or it could possibly be skewed, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it could possibly be symmetric just depending on um, the ages of those CEOs. All right, let's look at the last one. So here it says the weights of each banana in a shipment. So the weights of each banana, right, are those going to vary? 
Not really, right? The weights of bananas are more or less the same. And so, well, yes, you may have a banana that weighs a little bit more and a banana that weighs a little bit less, but overall, you're talking about a pretty uh, constant same uh, weight. Uh, and so this would make it a symmetric graph. And you see how we say this is likely? Because we are not 100% sure. We don't actually have the data points. So we can't guarantee it is symmetric, but we think that it's most likely based on the information we're given. And our, our explanation, most bananas are probably around the same weight. All right, let's continue. Um, so uh, number 10 talks about natural minimum, maximum, and skewness. So skewness is often present in data sets that have a natural minimum or maximum. That is, a value that prevents the distribution from spreading out to one side and creating the potential for skewness in the other direction. For each of the following, determine whether the data set has a natural minimum a natural maximum, or neither. Then decide whether the, dist the distribution is likely skewed right, skewed left, or symmetric. So let's look at the first one. So here it has the set of all incomes of recent college graduates. So is there a natural minimum, maximum, or neither? Well, of course, there's a, ma a natural minimum, right? The natural minimum is zero dollars. You're not getting paid at all right? That is the natural minimum. Can we say a natural maximum? No, because if you say, okay, um, you know, a college uh, graduate's getting paid $80,000, is that the maximum? Well, no, because there could be someone getting paid 90000 or or 100000 But a natural minimum? Yes. Nobody can get paid less than $0. So that is our natural minimum. Distribution likely skewed left, skewed right, or symmetric? That's right, it would be skewed right. Okay, because again, right, just like kind of looking back at this example, right? When you think about it, if this was like $40,000, 50000 60, 70, 80, 90, right? The lower amount, that's going to be more common than the higher amount. Right? Um, because I believe the average college salary is about $67,000 on average, um, right? But a lot of people um, will get paid less than that, like probably in the 50,000s. Uh, and then you'll have a fewer people who are getting, you know, very highly paid and those maybe getting 100,000 or, or more than that. Um, so this should definitely be skewed to the right. And again, right, if, you're, if you have a hard time seeing it, make yourself a little uh, graph, plot some um, data points, and, and see what kind of curve you get. All right, let's look at B. The ages of children in a 12 and under elite basketball league. So here, do we have a natural minimum, maximum, or neither? Well, if you think about 12 and under, the 12 is what? It's a maximum. If you're older than 12, you cannot attend this league. If you are 12 or under, then you can attend. So this has a natural maximum. At 12 years old. Uh, distribution likely skewed left, right, or symmetric. So, what do you think? Well, skewed right, probably not. Um, if you're talking about an elite basketball league, right, you're probably, um, kids are probably not going to enroll until they're maybe six or seven years old. So if you were to draw a little graph that started from maybe 
you know, age 1 to 12. Probably from 1 to 6, you're going to have very few data points. Uh, and then probably 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, those are going to have way more um, uh, students or, or uh, children playing. And so this one would most likely be skewed. All right, let's look at 11. Um, let's look at more mounds. The statistical term for one mound distribution is unimodal. So uni meaning one. The two graphs below are what we call bimodal distributions. What do you think the term bimodal distribution means? Well, looking at the graphs, what do you notice about both of these graphs? They have two humps. And what does the prefix bi mean. It means two, right? Bicycle, two wheels. Um, so here we have the graph, or the graphs have two maps. So bimodal means two What do you think we mean when we describe a graph as multimodal? What about a uniform graph? So let's look. Well, multi means what? Multiple, right? So more than one, which is uni, more than two, which is bimodal. So here we're talking about more, uh, many mounds, right? Many. Uh, and then what would we consider a uniform graph? Well, a uniform graph, right? Uniform means kind of consistent, steady. So in a uniform graph, we um, would say maybe a similar height all the way across. So a, f a fairly flat graph. All right, let's look at number 13. When we look at a real data, it may be more difficult to identify the number of mounds. How would you describe the graph to the right? So um, just like before, uh, let's try to draw a shape. Right? Let's try to draw a shape. So let's see, we'll start off, right? It goes up, and it goes down, and it goes up again, uh, and then it more or less just continues down. So how many mounds does it have? It has two, which means this should be bimodal. And we could put in there two mounds. All right, let's look at 14. Uh, the graph, the following graph is made from the same data set as number 13. Estimate the bin size in each graph, right? So here, you see how they're putting multiple um, uh, bars, whereas here they're using bins. So they're going from 100 to 200, 200 to 300, 300 to 400. Um, so what would our estimated bin size be? for the first graph, uh, and then the second graph. So let's look at the first graph. So this is minutes, right? So from here to here, you're talking 100 and, uh, from 100 to 150, which means 50 minutes in between. Um, and then we're looking at more than two. So probably about 20 minutes. So if it was half, then it would be 25 minutes. It's a little bit more than that. So let's say about 20 minutes. Now, if we look at the second graph, okay, we go here 100 to 200, right? Uh, and then this is a little bit more than two uh, makes that, which means if it was just two, each would be 50, but it's a little bit more than that, so it should be less than 50 minutes. So um, let's do a nice 45 minutes to kind of make it, you know, a nice uh, round number. Um, and why does the maximum value for the frequency change from the first graph to the second graph? So here you see how it's not, um, doesn't look so dramatic. 
Um, why? Because when you change the frequency, right, when you change the bins, uh, what happens is that each bin fits more data values. And so you don't see as much of, um, of that uh, kind of varying of the bounds. So we could say something like wider bins fit more data. Uh, so bars go higher. Right, because you have more data points to put. Uh, and then how would you describe the second graph? Right? So is it a unimodal, bimodal, or multimodal? And so again, let's try to draw a graph. So we start kind of off in the bottom. We're going to go up, and then we go down. So this one has only one mound. So unimodal. All right, let's look at D. It says, explain how certain decisions when constructing graphs can impact how many mounds it will appear to have. So we could say wider bins can hide details while narrower bins can make the big picture harder to see. So it's kind of like finding the balance between the two. Okay, there's no, there's no such thing as the perfect graph. You just try to find the graph that's going to best describe the data you're being given. Right, so that you don't have uh, people misinterpreting the facts of your graph. All right, and so now we have what's what we call extremely large or small values. We call them outliers. Okay, and these can uh, very often mess up um, our our uh, data, um, especially average, and we'll see that later. Um, so outliers are important to note when describing a graph. Uh, they can be an indication of an error made while collecting or recording data. It's important to note so you can check for these errors. Identify the outliers on the following graphs. Okay, so um, it's something that is very apart from uh, everybody else. So for example, say in a test, right, you have everybody scored, you know, in the 80s and below, and then one person scored 100. That's an outlier, right? And so, like me as as the in instructor, if I'm looking to give you know a curve, I may want to remove that outlier of a hundred and go to my next data point, which may be you know an eighty nine or an eighty or an eighty seven, and use that to help me with the curve. So here, this is clearly our outlier. Uh, and if we look again, you see here. This is, it's like separate. It's like an outsider. It's completely, you know, uh, apart from the group. It's not following the normal trend that everybody else followed. That's our outlier. All right. Um, so now we talk about what I mentioned before, which are called the measures of central tendency. So that's mean, median, mode, and range. Uh, and so um, we use these to summarize our data. Uh, and so it says, graphs are a great way to see the big picture for a data set at a glance. They give us a general idea of the shape, center, and variation. Once we have this big picture, statisticians often like to look more closely at the center and variation of the data set. They do this by finding numerical summaries, which are calculations that give numbers we can use to represent the center and variation of the data set. So the, nu the numerical summaries used depends on the shape of the data set. So looking at a graph will always be an important first step. So again, right, when we talked about the shape of the distribution, we had two different categories. We had symmetric, 
and then we had skewed. And then remember, skewed broke into skewed right or skewed left. Uh, and so if we have a symmetric data uh, set or distribution, then our numerical summaries will be the mean, which is or our average, that's another word, average, and standard deviation. Uh, and then if we have skewed, then the median, which is the middle in, uh, in uh, numerical order, uh, and the interquartile range, or IQR, which we'll talk about in a moment. So we will explore more about why the shape is so important on next class. For now, we will familiarize ourselves with these measures and what they mean in context for different data sets. All right, so here we have, uh, we start with our mean. So this is the measure of center for a symmetric distribution mean. Uh, this is the measure of the center interpreted as the typical value of a data set or average. So in order to find it, it's very, very simple. We just add up all the values and then we divide by how many values. Uh, and this notation, okay, we read this as x bar this stands for the mean. So if you see X bar, it's like a, a statistical notation to find the mean. All right, so let's, let's do it. Let's put it into practice. So in our first example, it says, the presiding judge of the U.S. Supreme Court is called the Chief Justice. Consider the ages of the first six Chief Justices at their confirmation. So 44 years old, uh, 56, 51, 45, 59, and 56. Find the mean age for the first six chief justices. Show your work and round to the nearest tenth. All right, so we're trying to find the mean, which again is the same as X bar. Uh, and what goes on the top? The sum, right? So we're going to have to add 44 plus 56 plus 51 plus 45 plus uh, 59 plus 56 and we're going to divide it by how many we added so one two three four five six all right add up those numbers together you should get 311 divide it by six and then we're going to get approximately since it says round to the nearest tenth we would get approximately 51.8 Um, and this is the uh, bar, well, really, this is a histogram because they're touching. Here's the histogram that shows those ages. So you see these bins, this is going from 44 to 51, from 51 to 58, and from 58 to 65. So this is our quantitative data because both of our X and Y axes are numerical. Uh, and so here we have two people inside of this bin. So that's the 44 and 51. Here we have three people between 51 and 58. So one, two, three. Uh, and then we just have one person um, who's from the 58 to 65, uh, which is that one right there. All right. So now it says... Now, uh, now find the mean age of the most recent six um, chief justices. So those were the first six, and then this is the most recent. Um, show your work. All right, so again, our mean, which is X bar, will be, we'll add up all those together. So 60 plus 62 plus 62 plus 63 plus 56 plus 69. And then one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, add those together. You get 372 divided by six, which approximately 62 years old. Okay, so that is our mean or our average age. Uh, and then here is our histogram. So here you see 
as we can kind of take, uh, tell from glancing at these values, these recent six uh, chief justices are uh, definitely older. Um, and so here you see there's only one person in between the 51 to 58 range. Uh, and then you have four people between the 58 to 65 range, and then one person between 65 and, and uh, 72. Uh, and so it says, you have just found uh, numbers to represent the center or typical age of each data set. Complete the following to compare these two groups. Okay, so now we could say the first six chief justices were typically about how many years old? So if we look back here, right, we could round this to about 52 years old. Right, so we could say about... 52 years old, while the six most recent chief justices were typically about 62 years old. So the six most recent chief justices were typically older or younger? Older than the first six chief justices. Okay, so that is how to find mean. Uh, now let's talk about median. Uh, so in the uh, median or middle number also has two steps. And the first step is extremely important because a lot of people forget the first step. Okay, because as you could see in the previous examples, the information will not be given to you in order. Okay, now when you find the mean, it doesn't matter if they're in order because all we're doing is adding them up. In the median, it does matter because we're trying to find the middle. So the first step, you must write the list in numerical order, from smallest to largest. After that, you find what is in the middle. Uh, so if n is odd, there will be just one number in the middle, and that's, that's your median. Uh, and if n is even, there'll be two numbers in the middle, and then you have to find the average of those two numbers to get your median. The median is our measure of center for skewed data sets. Okay, so when we had our symmetric, our mean was our measure of center. But when we have a skewed data set, then we use the median instead. So here it says, suppose an office manager forms a committee to explore the best way to update a few key human resources policies. The members of the committee have the following ages. So here are the ages. Find the median age of the committee members. And then here it, it reminds you, although it doesn't, it most likely won't in the practice problems, homework, uh, test problems, um, that you will need to rewrite the ages in ascending order. Okay, so. That's the youngest, so 29. Mm -hmm. After that, looks like 32. 39. 41. 47. 53. And 64. All right, now they're in order. Uh, and then the easiest way that I know to find the middle is you just cancel one from each side until you hit the middle. So I cancel one from here, I cancel one from here. Cancel another from here, cancel another from here. Cancel from here, cancel from here. And guess what? We only have one number in the middle because you see these are odd. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is an odd, which means we will just have one number in the middle, which is our median. So. Median, 41 years old. Now it says, write a sentence interpreting the median as the center, or remember, typical value of the data set. So we could make a sentence saying, the typical age on the committee is 41 years old. All right, let's continue. All right, let's look at example five. So it says the manager realizes that there are a lot of employees in the office who are recent college graduates and decides that one should be added to the committee to help the age diversity. 
The new committee member is 23 years old. Find the median of the committee now. Okay, and so this is a continuation from the previous example. So let me write that here. Continue from previous page. Okay, so here we add a new person, 23 years old. So if we look back, okay, at these lists, where's 23 going to fall? It's going to fall in the front, right? So let's rewrite it. We're going to have 23, then 29, 32, 39, 41, 47, 53, and 64. So now if we find the median, we'll do the same thing. Cancel one from each side until we find the middle. But here is the problem, right? Because there is now eight people, you have two people in the middle. So how do we find the median? So to find the median, you're going to add these together and divide by two because there's always just going to be two numbers. Um, so 39 plus 41 is 80 divided by two, which gives you 40 years old. And this is the median. So. When we add it in that age of 23, our median of 41 is now 40. So uh, how did the new member affect the typical age of the committee? We could say the new member did not really affect the typical Right, because from 40 to 41 or 41 to 40, that's very close. So not a very big difference um, in the age. Now, think about this. What if they added a person who was, say, 58? Then we would have to add the person in between here, right? And so then now the two middle numbers would be different. You would have these two in the middle. And if you take the average of these two, you're going to get a, a pretty higher value uh, than 40. So that would change it more. But in this case, it didn't really change it that much. All right. And then we look at the mode, which really is the easiest of all of them, because mode, there is very, very little work to do. Uh, one way that you can think of mode is most. Okay. Which data value rep repeats the most? So you may have just one mode, you may have more than one mode, you may have no mode, or a range of closely spaced values referred to as a mode. So this is the definition, really. So these are the, the three different kind of options that you can have. You can have just one, you can have more than one. So if you have uh, two different data values that repeat the same amount of time, then they are, um, then you'd have more than one one if only one repeats and then no mode is if they're all repeat only once so each data value occurs that is the only time you're gonna have no mode so let's look at these examples so it says find the mode for each of the following hourly wages given in dollars per hour so let's look at it and let's look for that most. Is there anything repeating? Well, here I see 12, 12. Okay. Is there anything else that repeats as well? No. So this is the mode. Mode is 12. All right. We have 10, 15, 15, 20, 20, 23. So here, 15 repeats twice and 20 repeats twice. You see? So here we have more than one mode. So both of them will be our mode. 15 and 20. Uh, and then the last one we have uh, 10, 15, 21, 24, 25, 30. There is no repeat, so we say no mode. 
And it's as simple as that. So here, number seven says, create a data set of at least five test grades that has no mode. So just remember, if it has no mode, what does that mean? No mode means no repeats. So we could say anything we want. We could say somebody scored a 56, somebody scored a 74, somebody scored a 76, an 85, uh, and a 91. And there you go. This data set has no mode because there is no repeat. Create a data set of at least 10 quiz grades that has two modes. So two modes means we need to make it the same value. And so here, you could do it as much as you want. So if we want to be real dramatic, we could do something like this. Let's say somebody scored uh, a 60. And then let's say we had four 70s. So one, two, three, four. Let's say we had four 80s. One, two, three, four four and then we have a 90. You see? So here repeated four times, repeated four times, so 70 and 80 would be your two modes. Now if I had 70 say only, uh, the 70s repeated three times and the 80s repeated four times, well then there's only one mode because 80 repeated the most. But when you have two different data values, or even three different da uh, data values, that repeat the same number of times, that is when they are each going to be considered the mode. So there are many, many ways to do this, right? As long as you keep uh, that into account. All right, and then let's look at number eight. So here it says, a baseball game sells tickets at varying prices depending on the location of the seats. There are 2,000 tickets that cost $250 each, 10,000 tickets that cost $50 each, and 30,000, uh, sorry, 35,000 tickets that cost $20 each. What is the mode for the 47,000 ticket prices? So this is easy, right? Because if you think about this, right, if you were to make a list, that would include 47 data points. So insanely long, right? We're obviously not going to write 47,000 uh, values, right? But think about it. Which one would repeat the most? Here, you're going to have 250 written 2,000 times. You're going to have $50 written 10,000 times. And then you're going um, to have $20 written 35,000 times. So which one is repeated the most? The $20. So the mode is $20. More tickets are priced, oops, priced at $20 than any other price. All right, and now in this last part, we compare the mean versus the median. Um, so it says, consider the following list of salaries for employees in a dental office. A, find the mean and median salary of these employees. All right, so for the mean, we are gonna add up all these values and divide by how many there are. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All right, so we know we're dividing by 10. Now, if you add up all these values, you're going to get 422,000. If you divide this by 10, you're gonna end up with 42,200. Okay, so this is the mean or average salary. Now let's look at the median. Now, if we look at the list, first of all, let's see if they're in order. So 16,000, 25, 31, 32, 36, 40, 40, 62, 65, and 74. So these are already in order. Now this is 10, which means it's an even number, which means we're gonna have two in the middle. So if I go cancel, 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 these are the two values in the middle. So to find my median, I have to find the average of these two numbers. So I add them together, 36,000 plus 40,000 
divided by 2. Okay? So if we do that, we end up with 38 dollars. So that would be the mean and median of this um, data set. Now look at B. It says, suppose that we include two dentist salaries in our list of five, uh, sorry, $150,000 and $160,000. Find the new mean and median salary. Okay, so here these are dentist salaries. So this is going to be dentist, I'm going to just say one. Uh, and then dentist two. So dentist one, he's going to get $1,500. Uh, and then a thousand, I'm sorry, $150,000. Uh, and then dentist two will get $160,000. Okay. Um, so now let's find the new uh, mean and median. All right. So for our mean, right, we're going to add up all the values. And this time, divide by 12. So now if we add up all 12 values, you should get 732,000. Divide, and you get 61,000. Okay, so this is the new mean. Now let's see the median. So again, we have 12 data points, which means we're going to have two in the middle. However, if we restart this, all right, so uh, let me use this. So we're going to do 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and 1. Now these are the two values in the middle. So really, you're just going to have 40,000 plus 40,000 divided by 2, which of course is just 40,000. Okay, so by adding these two uh, salaries uh, into our list, we got this for our mean and median. Okay, so both values changed, right? They're, neither stayed the same. But as you can see, one of them changed a lot more drastically than the other. So part C says, which measure, mean or median, was not much changed by the inclusion of higher salaries? Explain why it did not change as much. So it's very clearly that the median was not that much changed. So it went from 38,000 to 40,000. Not a very big difference. So we can say the median was not much changed. Why the extra data values shifted the middle up a bit, but the middle salaries are all similar. So there was not much of a big change. If you look at the middle salaries here, they're pretty close together. So not a big difference. D says, which measure, mean or median, was shifted, was affected quite a bit by the inclusion of the higher salaries? And then why did it change so much? Well, this is also obvious, right? The mean changed dramatically. It went from 42,200 to 61,000. Okay, so we can say the mean was increased a lot. And if we want to be specific, we could say by $18,800. Why? Well, since all, oops, sorry, all data, oh, data <laughs> values are used to calculate the mean. The mean is 
more affected by higher or really lower salaries, right? So it could have also been the other way around. Very low salaries would have also changed the mean, but it would go lower instead of higher. All right, lastly, the median has been labeled in each of the following distributions. Estimate the locations and label the mean and mode on each distribution. All right, so here we have skewed left. So as you can see, the tail is on the left side uh, and or low outliers, okay? And so in this case, you would have your, um, your mean less than the median, maybe here. Uh, and then your mode, the one repeated the most, well, that's the height of your mound. So the mode would be about here. Now, if we look at a symmetric uh, distribution, right, then all of them are the same. So the median is more or less the same place as the mean, which is more or less the same place as the mode. So when you have that symmetric distribution, then you have the mean, median, and mode in that center. Uh, and then when it's skewed right, so the tail is on the right, right, or high outliers, right, so the high values are outliers, uh, then here what happens with your mode, well your mode of course is the top of that, that mound because that tells you, remember, the, the y-axis or the vertical axis is frequency, so this is the highest frequency, that's the mode, uh, but your mean would be higher than the median, so the mean might be somewhere here. All right, and so that is more or less how the mean, median, and mode are related to uh, symmetric distributions uh, and then the skewed distributions.